Good morning, Christ Community Church. Merry Christmas. I just love this day. Of course, we celebrate Jesus every day, but I love that we have a certain day that we can come together and just worship him for coming down here. He came down here from heaven to come be with regular people. You know what I'm saying? Like, that. like he's the king of kings, the lord of lords, but he came down here in human form. Like, that's just awesome. And he came down here for you. He came down here for me. And then he died on the cross, so we have that free gift. Okay? So joy to the world. The Lord has come. Okay, let's sing and let's worship our king. Please stand. Everybody sing joy, joy to the world. Oh, oh, the Lord, the oh, oh, Lord is come. Mm -hmm. Let her receive, receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. Let heaven and nature sing. Let heaven and nature sing. Go to tell the tell of His glory. Shout the good story. Go shout the good story. The Savior is born. Let 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 Sing joy to the world, sing joy to the 
You know, that's a Christmas song, but then we did um, total praise. I know maybe some people were like, well, that's not Christmassy. Just remember, during this Christmas season, some people are going through a storm. Jesus came to save. He also came to give us that peace in the midst of our storm. So he is still here in every season that we are going through. So in case you're somebody that may be going through something this Christmas season, everyone's not all happy and joyful today. Let's just be real. But we have Christ. Christ, we're st we can still worship Christ because he'll still give us that peace in the midst of our storm. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you. Lord God, we thank you that we have a day um, set aside where we can appreciate your birth. Where we can appreciate that you left the comforts of heaven, Lord God, to come into this earth, this broken earth. And you came to save us. For us being broken, Lord God, we thank you that 
you were born, but we also recognize that you were born to die. You were born to sacrifice yourself, God. So I pray that on today, you would show us how to sacrifice. Lord, would you show us how to love? Lord, would you show us how to slow down enough to hear your voice so that we can do and be the things that you called us to do and be? Lord God, would you help us to lay aside every weight that so easily besets and the sin that gets us down, God, that we can run with patience the race that you have before us, Father. Lord God, I thank you for all my brothers and sisters here. God, I pray that you would bless them, Lord God, to overflowing. Lord, those that are feeling broken and not feeling the quote-unquote Christmas spirit, Lord God, would you speak to them right now in Jesus' name? Lord God, we pray that you touch the messenger that will bring the word to us today, Lord God, that our, heart, our hearts and our eyes and our ears can be open to hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church family, can we give God a hand clap of praise? God is so worthy. Amen. Merry Christmas, everyone. Oh, man, that sounds very weak. Merry Christmas, everyone. Amen. It is such a blessing to be able to gather on this Sunday morning and to be able to worship our Savior, our King, our Lord, our sanctifier, our healer. He's so much to us. And it's such a blessing to be able to gather together and celebrate him. You know, one of the traditions that we have in our church is that anytime it's somebody's birthday, we make a big fuss about it. We always sing happy birthday to him. We put him on the spot. We make a big deal about him. Well, on today, we celebrate Jesus' birth. And if there's ever anyone that deserves to be made a big fuss about, it's certainly Jesus Christ. Amen. And so it's a blessing to be able to gather together on this day and remember and celebrate the birth of our Savior. How many of you guys know, had that baby not been born, we would still be lost in our sins? Amen, somebody? You'll still be caught up in the muck and mire of the mess of your life. But because that baby was born, because that baby came to the world, we have redemption and salvation. So today, although it's cold outside, it's above negative. Praise God, it's above zero. But although it's cold outside, today is a great day to celebrate our Savior. And I just want to welcome everyone this Sunday morning at Christ Community Church. Welcome to our family. Welcome to our friends. And I also want to extend a welcome to anyone that may be coming um, to check us out for the first time, whether you be in-house or if you're at home. Uh, thank you so much for being a part um, of our service today. We really appreciate you being here. Um, our hope and our prayer for you is the same hope and prayer that we have for ourselves. And that is that we will connect with the living God we don't come to church just out of routine. We come to church because we want to connect with God. We don't gather together just because it's something we do. We gather together because we have an expectation that we're going to meet the living God on today. And we hope and we pray that you will meet this God as well. If you want to get more information about our ministry, you can reach us either by going to our webpage, which is worships ccc.com. Um, on the webpage, you can find our email address. You can send us an email. Our email address is info. That's I-N-F-O at worshipccc.com. We would love to connect with you that way. Or you can always give us a phone call. Our phone number is 216-417-7958. Give us a call. We'd love to connect with you and share with you more about the God that we serve. And if you have any questions about us, we would love to answer that question as well. Amen. So we want to keep the service going today because we do understand that today is Christmas. And we do know that people are preparing to meet with their family um, a little later on today. So we do want to um, be mindful of that. And so we're going to move right to our time of offering. Let me just first of all say praise God for his faithfulness to this ministry. Can we give God a hand clap of praise? God has been providing for us every step of the way, and we're just so thankful for God's provision. I want to continue to encourage us as a church body to contribute and give to the work that God is doing in and through Christ Community Church. If you want to support the ministry, there are three ways you can do that. You can do it by going to our webpage, again, worshipccc.com. There's a tab that says giving. Just click on that tab. you get all the instructions of how you can give that way. You can also text to give. Just simply text CCC Giving to 73256. Um, or if you're in house, you can give your contribution to the greeter in the back. She so make sure it goes to the appropriate place. Or if you're at home and you're viewing service, you can always mail in your gift to our physical address, 
which is 2065 Lee Road, Cleveland Heights, Ohio, 44118. God bless you. Thank you guys so much for your contributions. We're going to move right on with the rest of our service. I'm going to pray for us. And then following uh, my prayer, uh, Brother Daryl Childress is going to come up. Now, you guys need to know, uh, Brother Daryl is my man. I don't mean that like in a romantic way, but I mean he's my homeboy. And I have a lot of love for Brother Daryl. And uh, uh, I appreciate him so much because he has so many gifts. Uh, some of you guys know he can play basketball. He actually was our basketball coach last year uh, for our basketball team that we had in the league. But in addition to playing basketball, he can also sing. And um, he sings some of my favorite songs. And I'm not going to put them on the spot too badly. But if you ever want to hear Jesus at the center of my joy, uh, Jesus at the center of my joy, you want to hear Brother Daryl sing that song because he can sing it like nobody else can sing it. As a matter of fact, I might ask him to do a part two today. Uh, <laughs> But um, he's a, just a, he has a beautiful voice, and he's going to bless us with a Christmas song this morning. So let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much for this great blessing of being able to gather together on this Sunday to be able to celebrate our Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for all that you have done for us in and through Christ. And God, is our privilege, is our blessing to be able to contribute and give to the forward movement of the kingdom of God. Thank you, God, for inviting us to give of our finances to help support your work. Father, we understand that all that we have comes from you. There's not a dime that we have that did not come from your hand. But, Father, we are so thankful, dear God, that you have set up a system by which we can contribute that which you gave us in the first place, a portion of that to help your work and help your movement. Father, it's our honor to be able to participate in this offering so, Father, we thank you, God. We bless you. We honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Christ Community Church. I want to... Mary, did you know your baby boy would one day walk on water? Did you know your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did you know your baby boy has come to make you new? This child that you deliver will soon deliver you. Mary, did you know your baby boy will give sight to a blind man? Did you know your baby boy will calm a storm with his hand? Did you know? That your baby boy has walked where angels trod. And when you kissed your little baby, you kissed the face of God. Oh, Mary, did you know? Oh, Mary, did you know? The blind will see, the deaf will hear, and the dead will live again. Yeah. The lame will leave, the dumb will speak, the praises of the Lamb. Mary, did you know your baby boy? Is Lord of all creation. Did you know your baby boy would one day rule the nations? Did you know your baby boy 
is heaven's perfect lamb and the sleeping child you holding is the grave Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much again for all that you've done for us. What can we render unto the Lord for all that he has done for us? Father, if we had 10,000 tongues, 10,000 days, it wouldn't be enough to adequately express our gratitude for all that you've done for us. God, we so appreciate you. We appreciate you, Father, because even when we weren't thinking about you, in your love, you were thinking about us. We're thankful, dear God, because, because you love us so much, you took on that which you hate so much. He that knew no sin, in reference to Jesus, took on sin so that we in return can be right with God. What a blessing. How great is the love that the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called the children of God, and that is what we are. Thank you so much, Lord, for your love for us. And we just want to say we appreciate it. Father, so often we're critical. We critique everything. We're so negative so often. Every now and then, God, it's important for us just to take time, just to express gratitude, just to say thank you. As a matter of fact, Lord, you say in your word that it is the will of God for us to express gratitude. Father, in the midst of all that's going on in our world, the cold weather and wars and riots and all kind of things going on in our schools and families being broken up and identity crisis, in the midst of all that's going on, God, we thank you that you're still in control. None of these things take you by surprise that you are sovereignly working out your will and your purpose on this planet. And for that, God, we say thank you. And not only, God, are you doing that on this planet, but, Father, you're doing that in our lives. In the midst of all that's going on in our lives, in the midst of all the chaos, the difficulties and the trials and tribulations, Father, we can rest at night knowing that you are sovereign over our lives. And for that, we say thank you. Father, we ask, dear God, that, that you would minister to our hearts as we open up your word. We thank you, Father, for access to the very word of life, the very truth of God. We ask, dear God, that you will speak to us. God, you know the needs of your people. You know those of us that are here today that are struggling. Yeah, it's Christmas. It's the holiday season. But, Father, we're struggling. Maybe we're struggling all the more because it is the holiday season. God, would you give strength to that person? Would you give encouragement to that person? Would you give joy to that person? Some of us, dear God, need to be comforted by your word. God, would you give comfort to those that need comfort? Some of us need to be challenged. Father, would you give challenge to those that need to be challenged? Whatever the need of your people is, God, we pray that you administer to those needs according to your will. We love you, Father. We bless you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen, church family. Well, if you have your Bibles, can you please join me in the book of Matthew? And today we want to look at Matthew chapter 1, and we want to reflect this morning on verses 21 through 23. Matthew chapter 1, and I want to read for us verse 21 through verse number 23. Matthew chapter 1. Starting at verse number 21, the word of God reads like this. 
She will bear a son, and you should call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they should call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Amen. May God add a blessing to the hearing and reading of his holy word. Amen. Amen. Well, today is a special day without a doubt because on this day we celebrate one of the most important events in history. We celebrate on today the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, to be clear, by no means am I trying to suggest that Jesus' birthday was actually on December 25th. Uh, we actually don't know that. Probably more than likely it was not on in December at all. But on this day, we have chosen to celebrate his birth. And quite honestly, because of all the commercialism associated with this day, we actually thought about providing an alternate service than actually having, than having an in-person service. We actually thought about a few months ago, like, well, maybe we should provide an alternate service instead of having an in-person service. But as we began to think about it and began to process it more and more, we thought, what better day to celebrate the birth of our Savior than on a day that we routinely gather together to worship anyway? I mean, what better day to worship the birth of our Savior than on the day that we already have scheduled in our life, in the rhythm of our life, for us to gather together anyway. As a matter of fact, Christmas is actually a great day to worship because Christmas reminds us of why we worship. And my point this morning, I will keep it short, I will try. My point this morning is simply this, Christmas is a reminder of why we gather on Sunday. Christmas is a reminder of why we gather on Sundays. I want to argue today that Christmas has a much greater meaning and purpose than just exchanging gifts. Christmas has a much more significant purpose than just getting gifts under a Christmas tree. I want to argue today that there are three ways that Christmas reminds us of why we gather on Sunday. There are three ways that Christmas reminds us that we gather on why we gather on Sunday. First of all, Christmas reminds us that we gather to celebrate Christ. Christmas is a reminder that we gather to celebrate Christ. It's interesting because in the early church, they didn't celebrate the birth of Christ. In the early church, about the first 300 years or so, they celebrated the resurrection of Christ. They celebrated Jesus' ascension into heaven. But they didn't celebrate his birth. They didn't start to celebrate the birth of Christ until about the 4th century. And then around the Middle Ages, they began to talk about, well, what should we call this day that we set aside to celebrate the birth of Christ? Well, they said, well, number one, it should be about Christ, or whatever we call it, Christ should be in the name. And number two, it's a worship gathering. It's a worship service. It's a mass. So that should be in the name as well. And so as the early believers in the Middle Ages began to process what we should call this name, they thought about Christ, they thought about Mass, they thought about Mass, they thought about Christ. Why don't we call it Christ Mass, which evolved into Christmas? Christmas is actually a, celebrate, a celebration of Christ. It's a worship of the birth of our Savior. Now, we have made Christmas about children and gifts. But in actuality, Christmas is all about worship. As a matter of fact, when you read the Christmas narrative, when you read the birth narrative in the Bible, it's offered in Matthew and in Luke. When you read those narratives, worship is flooded in the stories. Worship is all over the story of Jesus' birth. Let me just read it for you really quickly. In Matthew chapter 2, the Bible says in Matthew 2 and verse 10, it says, And when they saw the star, the day here are the wise men, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And in going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. And what did they do, church? They fell down and worshiped him. This is so powerful on so many levels. First of all, notice that when they saw Jesus, the response they had to Jesus was worship. But notice that Jesus is not a fully grown man at this point. He's not 30-something years old. 
He don't have a beard like Pastor LaVert. Right? He's a child. And it's interesting because this indicates that Jesus is more than just a human being. Because we know from reading the Bible that the only person you are supposed to worship is God. Remember in the book of Revelations when the angels revealed themselves and the angels were so glorious, so full of power that when John saw the angels, he fell down to worship the angel. And the angel said, get up. Don't you do that. I'm a fellow servant. Worship God. Remember when Peter was operating in the fullness of the Holy Spirit, doing all kinds of wonders and all kinds of miracles, and, and people looked at him, and Cornelius was like, man, you're worthy of worship, and he fell down to worship Peter. Peter said, get up, boy. Don't worship me. Only worship God. And yet, when the wise men came into the house, and they saw the baby, the child, they fell down to worship. And nobody said, don't worship that baby. Don't worship that child. Nobody said that. They, were had, they had the right response because they understood that child is the great I am. The Bible says they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The same thing happens when Luke talks about the birth of Christ in Luke chapter 2. Let me just read how Luke records it. In Luke chapter 2 and verse number 8, the Bible says, In the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And notice what happens in verse 13. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts doing what? Praising God. There was worship in Matthew's account of Jesus' birth. There's worship in Luke's account as well. They're praising God. And what were they saying? Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among those whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste. In other words, they went with the quickness and found Mary and Joseph and a baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been, been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. And look at how the shepherd went away. The shepherds went away in verse 20. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Christmas is all about the celebration of Christ. Christmas is all about the worship of that baby. It is a reminder for us as believers when we gather together, our church service, our mass, should be about the worship of Christ. You know, it's interesting because some people are trying to take Christ out of Christmas. They call it Xmas now. They come up with alternatives. Instead of saying Christmas, it's about worshiping something else. They're trying to make Christmas all about commercialism and all about making a profit. So that, so that now when people think of Christmas, they don't even think about Christ anymore. They think about the gifts. People think about Christmas now, they don't even think about Jesus anymore. They just think about the gifts. But at the heart of Christmas is the worship of Jesus. Now, I want to say something kind of strong, so brace yourselves. I want to suggest to you that what we have done to Christmas, if we're not careful, we will also do to church service. Let me suggest to you that if we don't be careful that what we have done at Christmas, we let them hijack it, y'all. We let them make, we made it about like, uh, you know, I'm about to say something inappropriate. I'm not going to say that. But we made it about Santa Claus and reindeers and drummer boys and about trees. And we've drifted away 
from Christ. And if we're not careful, church service will also be about commercialism, making a profit, about the performance, about making you happy, and less about Jesus. The fact of the matter is Christmas is a reminder that we gather together to worship the baby because we know what that baby will become. That baby will grow up and will become the savior of the whole world. He will die for our sins so that we can have redemption through him. So Christmas is important because it reminds us of why we gather. It reminds us that we gather to worship the savior. But it's also important, it's also good to have uh, Christmas on the Sunday because Christmas reminds us that we gather to celebrate salvation in Christ. We gather to worship Christ, but we also gather to celebrate salvation in Christ. It's interesting because the Bible says in verse number 21 that she will bear a son and his name shall be called Jesus. Yeshua. The name Jesus means salvation. The name Yeshua means the Lord is salvation or the Lord provides salvation. This is a beautiful name because it speaks of God's desire to save his people. Oftentimes, we can think of God as being angry and always wanting to hurt us. But the fact of the matter is we serve a God that desires to save. And it's embedded in the name of his son, Jesus. Jesus is the epitome of God's heart and desire to want to save his people. The Bible says that Jesus is our salvation. How many of you guys know that? It's not just that he provides salvation, but the Bible says Jesus is our salvation. In other words, if you want salvation, you need to be next to Jesus. You need to hold on to Jesus because he is our salvation. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30, it says that, and because of him, you are in Christ Jesus who became to us. Can you say us? Us means us. That's us. This is us. Us. He became to us wisdom from God. Jesus is our wisdom. He became to us our righteousness. You do understand that Jesus is our righteousness. We don't boast in our own righteousness. We boast in the righteousness he provides for us. Amen? It's kind of like having kids at your house. If your kids are eating, they can't boast that they're eating their food. They should boast that they're eating the food you provide for them. Oh, man, y'all quiet on me, parents. I'm eating good at home. Yeah, you're eating good because your parents provide food for you to eat good at home. We don't boast in our own righteousness. He is our righteousness. And 1 Corinthians 1.30 says he's our sanctification. He's the one making us holy, and he's our redemption. Jesus is our salvation. Christmas is a reminder that God stepped into human history to provide redemption for his people. The Bible says that the blood of bulls and goats couldn't do it. Stop sacrificing those animals because that blood would never cover your sin. The Bible says a holy prophet couldn't do it. Don't place all your trust in a prophet. They will let you down. A religious leader can't do it. Don't place all your trust in a religious leader because we know a religious leader will let you down. The only one that can provide redemption for us is Jesus. Now, this is beautiful truth. I don't know about you guys, but this really excites me because the longer I walk with the Lord, the longer I'm saved, the more I realize how much I need the Lord. You know, I used to think when I was a younger believer that at some point in my journey, I would transform, I would morph into a super Christian. Like, I really thought at some point in my journey, I would be able to go into a phone booth, take off my shirt and have a big ass on my chest and walk out and fly and save people. Like, I really thought that I was going to be a super Christian. I really thought as I got older in my faith, learned the Bible more, studied the scriptures more, walked with God more, that I would get stronger. Like, I would be like Arnold Schwarzenegger in the faith, you know? That's what I thought. But the more I walk with the Lord, the more I realize that if it had not been for the Lord on my side, ain't no telling where, brother, be at. I need him. I need him. The fact of the matter is, church, we can't save ourselves. 
We ain't good enough. Now, I know you came to church to feel good. I hope that you've been blessed by the songs and by the things that we've been trying to do to really be a blessing to you. But let me also bring it down a notch. You can't save yourself. You need a savior. None of us are good enough. I love you. You look nice. Everybody looks good and smell good today, but you ain't good enough. We can't meet God's standard. The Bible says it like this in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. By grace, you have been saved. Not by works, but by grace, you have been saved. Through faith, God activates your faith. The faith that you place in him through that avenue, by grace, you have been saved. And this is not your own doing. It is, without a doubt, the gift of God. No believer may not ever say they never got a gift on Christmas. Yes, you did. If you are a believer in Christ, been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, you have a gift from God. Salvation through his Son. The Bible says in verse 9 of Ephesians chapter 2, it's not the results of works so that no one can boast. You do understand that when we gather together on Sunday morning, nobody should come in boasting about how holy they were the previous week. Nobody should come in like, man, y'all should have seen me this last week. I was a good Christian. I did everything right. I said my prayers before I ate. I ain't do nothing bad. I didn't smoke, and I didn't chew. Whatever chewing means, I didn't do it. I wasn't out clubbing. I ain't watching inappropriate shows. I was a good Christian this week. No, we don't come together beating our chest, talking about how holy we were the previous week. You know what we do when we come together? We say, praise God that his grace kept me through another week. Because if his grace was not all over my house, all over me, I might have slipped. But I was showered by his grace. When we come together, we don't boast about ourselves. We boast about our God. Let me tell you how God came through for me this time. Let me tell you how God came through for me that time. Let me tell you I'm not even worthy of God working on my behalf, and he still worked on my behalf. God is good. That's why we come together. We celebrate the redemption that we have in Jesus. That's what we do. I've determined early on in, 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 in the ministry that I'm not going to try to manipulate anybody to worship God. I'm not, you guys will never see me coming up here doing some flips trying to break dance, spinning on my head. You'll never see me doing none of that kind of stuff to provoke some type of response from you. Because I am just convinced that if the grace of God did not touch your life over the previous week, if you're not satisfied and thankful that God kept you through another week, if you're not impressed by the very grace of God in your life, there ain't nothing I can do. I can't get a joke book and try to tell you jokes. Make you feel good to come to church? No, if you're not impressed with God's goodness and grace in your life, you might as well stay at home because I ain't got nothing for you. We come here to celebrate his grace and his mercy. We come here to celebrate, watch this, y'all, Jesus, the Lord is salvation. That's what we come here to celebrate. Jesus, the Lord is salvation. We come here to celebrate him. It's interesting because... Some people have the mindset that I come, that we come to church so that we can get brownie points with God. Let me knock that down. Let me block that one. We're not gathering to gain or earn salvation in any way. It's not as if God is up in heaven giving you brownie points because you came to church. Don't think you're getting two stars in heaven because you came to church on Christmas. It's commendable. Thank you for coming to church. But God is not keeping track of your attendance record in heaven. God is not going to call your home because you miss church. That's not what God is going to do. We don't come to church to earn favor or earn any kind of recognition with God. You know why we come to church? We come here because we come to celebrate him and thank him for keeping us another week, to hear the word of God, to be encouraged in our faith so that we can go another week praising God, serving God, doing the work of God so we can be about God. In other words, church service is all about God. It's all about Christ. This truth is so central to the church that Jesus set up two reminders, two ordinances, two practices in the church to remind us of salvation in him alone. 
These two symbols are both symbolic of salvation. You know what they are? Baptism and communion. What does baptism do? Baptism is a public witness before the world. When somebody is baptized, what they're saying is that I am dead to my old life. And because of the work of Christ in my life, I am now raised with Christ to a new life. Because of what Jesus, not because of my effort, not because I kept the Ten Commandments, not because I'm a good boy or good girl, but because of what Jesus did for me, I am making public witness that I am dead to that old stuff. And he has raised me to a newness of life in him. It's symbolic of the salvation that we have through Christ. What is communion? Communion is not an opportunity just for us to eat some bread and drink some juice. But communion is a symbol of the fact that it's the blood of Christ and it's the body of Christ that sustains us. I so love how we do communion in church. I love the fact that we all get the same cup. You ever notice that when we have communion, I don't get a special cup? I don't get the pastor cup. Mine's is not overlaid in gold. I don't lift mine up like, look at my cup. Mine's is not bigger than anybody else. You ever notice that? I don't get a bigger cup, a shinier cup, right? I don't get the special, more expensive juice. I get the same cup. You ever notice how a person that's been saved for 50 years get the same cup that the pers of the person that's been saved for five minutes? Because the cup is symbolic that I don't care how long you've been saved, I don't care how long you've been in the game. You need the same blood. You ever notice that when we take communion, we don't take it in succession? We don't say one person go first and everybody else follows? You ever notice that I don't take my cup first? I'm like, now nah, y'all take y'all cup. I get my dibs first and then y'all take y'alls. You ever notice that we take the cup together to symbolize that we all equally share in this cup, in this salvation? And we take the bread together to symbolize that we all equally feast on Jesus. We do it together. It's symbolic of our salvation. The fact of the matter is, in the church, there are no big I's and little U's. Not in the church. I don't know how they operate out there in the world. But in the church, there are no big I's and little U's. And there are no big U's and little I's. In the church, we all drink from the same cup of grace. Now, don't get me wrong. We all function differently. We all have different gifts and different roles within the body of Christ. But no one person is superior than another person in the church. The only person that's the ultimate superior one is Jesus. And the reason why he's the ultimate superior one is because he's the only one that can give you salvation. My name's not Jesus. My name's Levert. I can offer you nothing. I don't even know my name have a meaning. My kids and I were looking it up. What does Levert mean? I don't know. It has some meaning. I'm named after my grandfather, but I don't know. It, it may mean good looking one. I don't know what it means. Right? But salvation can't be found in Levert. Salvation can't be found in Bishop so and so. Now, Bishop so and so may be able to preach like the best of them, he may be able to make you feel real good. He may be able to do spins and flips, but he can't give you salvation. S salvation not found in soloist so-and-so, sister so-and-so that can sing real good. That sister may sing like the best of them. She may sing you happy, but she can't sing you salvation. That's why in the church there's only one champion, and that's Jesus. And it's embedded in his name because he came to save that's why when they gather to see that baby, I'm pretty sure if the wise men were like the brothers I know, when they came in, they saw Joseph, they said, what's up? Maybe gave Mary a little hug. But when they saw Jesus, they fell down. Isn't that how the church should be? Brothers, we see another brother, what's up? Tap it up. Give him a little hug. Put the elbow in between it, but give him a little hug. Sister so and said, hey, sister, it's good seeing you. Nice little holy hug to the side. But when we get to see Jesus, or oh, we bow down, 
It's so unfortunate that that's not how we operate often in the church, is it? When we get to the church, guess what we do? We see the pastor, what we do? We bow down. We bow down. Oh, pastor so-and-so, bishop, minister, pope, whatever. You're so holy. That brother ain't so holy. He's a man like you and me. He's a human being like us. He struggled with sin like everybody. I have yet to meet a brother, a man, a person, period, that don't struggle with sin. I don't care how holy you are. I have yet to meet a person that in their secret moments in life, they don't struggle with sin. And sometimes God in his grace allow it to come to the surface. Just to remind you, don't you put your trust in that, brother. My wife and I was talking this week about a pastor in another city. And this particular pastor is coming up with this idea of growing marijuana in his church. Yeah, true story. Am I telling the truth, Kelly? Yep, we were talking about this brother the other day. And um, it was just a reminder to me that we got to place our trust in Christ. Because people do some of the most ignorant, silliest, tribe. Can I talk real with y'all? Dumb. I don't know if a stupidest is a word or not, but I'm going to say it. Stupidest. People have a tendency of messing up. That brother ain't the savior. Jesus is. Matter of fact, my wife and I were talking. This is not to throw any shade. When we were talking, we were saying how important it is for us in ministry to stay guarded uh, because there are so many opportunities to fall. And sometimes people come in with ill intentions, and they will cause you to fall. And we were saying, well, if, if a woman came in with ill intentions towards that brother, she, he, he may fall. <laughs> that brother ain't right. <laughs> The rest of us trying to fight it. That brother may cave in. In the church, we come to celebrate Christ. He is our Savior. May we at Christ Community Church not get so wrapped up in programs and performance, so wrapped up in trying to put together a good product, so wrapped up in trying to make our ministry look impressive that we forget to worship that baby in the manger. May we as a church never forget that salvation is found in no other name than the name of Jesus. Show honor, show respect, give props, all that is healthy, but only worship Jesus. Only worship Jesus. Well, here's my last point. Christmas is a reminder that we worship. Christmas is a reminder that we celebrate salvation in Christ. But, oh, I like this last point, y'all. Christmas reminds us that we gather to celebrate access to God through Christ. Oh, you got to appreciate this truth. You got to appreciate this truth. Look at what the Bible says here in verse number 23. It says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they should call his name Emmanuel, God with us. When you say Emmanuel, you're speaking Hebrew. Emmanu means with us. El, y'all know what El means. Like El Shaddai, El Elyon, Elohim. El means God. Emmanuel with us, El, God, Emmanuel. It means God with us. I love the name Emmanuel. I love the name Emmanuel because Emmanuel tells us how he saves us, and it also tells us the ultimate reason why he saves us. Emmanuel tells us how he saves us, and it also tells us the ultimate reason why he saves us. It tells us how he saved us. How did he save us? Well, notice that when you study the Bible very closely, certain things God does by speaking a word. Remember in creation? We don't hear about God putting on work boots, putting on a jump, jumpsuit, and going out plowing through the ground to make the earth, make trees and stuff. No, God spoke it. Let there be light. Light appeared. Let the trees appear. Trees appeared. God spoke the word. We know certain things God can do just by speaking it. God has that kind of creative power. He can just speak things into existence. Things that don't exist, God speak it, and now it exists. The only reason why light exists is because God said, let there be light. Had God not said, let there be light, there would be no light. God speaks it. And it occurs. But that's not how he saved us. 
He didn't say, be saved, and we were saved. It's interesting that God didn't save us by sending a prophet. He didn't save us by sending some religious leader. It's interesting that he saved us by coming into our world. Who would have ever thought, as high and majestic as God is, I mean, just imagine this, God dwells in unapproachable light, the Bible says, that in God's presence, there are angelic beings that their full-time job description is simply to cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. That's their job. That's the bomb job. Just cry out, holy, holy, holy. All they do is worship God day and night. None of us got that. The most popular celebrity don't have that. Even a celebrity, as hot as they are, they only hot for a moment. Am I, am I lying? My wife and I sometimes watch these shows to talk about the 2000s and the 90s and all this other stuff. And it's like, man, they were hot back in the 90s. But in 2021, don't nobody care about them. They was hot in the 90s. Some people say, oh, I forgot about him. That was my dog. But we forget about him. You only hot for a moment. At some point, your, your songs, your music is going to be old school. And at some point, you're going to die. Not to say it like that. But God has angelic beings that on a regular sing his praise. Nobody would have ever thought that this majestic God would ever leave the throne room of glory to come down into this filthy earth. Yet alone to come to a young peasant girl. Young little girl that nobody talked about, nobody knows. Little girl. Come to this little peasant girl and say, you're going to be the mother of the Savior. Nobody would have ever thought that. I mean, you would think that if God, as majestic as he is, was going to come to the earth, he would go to the White House. He would go to the palace. He would go to where there's recognition, where there's already respect. But that's not what he does. He comes to this young peasant girl and says, you're going to be the mother of the Savior. God saves us by being with us. That's why he's Emmanuel. He incarnated himself. The word became flesh and he tabernacled. He dwelled with us. He moved into our neighborhood. He saved us by coming into our world. But Emmanuel also tells us why he saves us. Why did God save us? Why did Jesus save us? Well, if you said to to keep us from the penalty of our sins, you're right. He did. So that we wouldn't have to die and live an eternity apart from him. You're right. But that's only part of it. Uh, he saved us certainly to die for our sins, but that wasn't the only reason why. And certainly he didn't save us so we can boast and go around and tell everybody how holy we are. He didn't save us for that purpose. Let me just say that as well. He did not save you so you can flaunt your holiness. So you can go around telling people, I'm saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Don't say it, show it. If you got to say it, then there may be a problem because you ain't showing it enough. You know why the ultimate reason why he saves us? It's because God wants to dwell with his people. Because he's Emmanuel, God with us. God, listen to this church, God has always desired to dwell with his people. That's always been God's desire. But you know what interferes with that desire to dwell with us? It's sin. I mean, we see this in the garden. You know, for example, in Genesis chapter 3, the Bible said God has such a bomb relationship with, with uh, Adam and Eve that the Bible says that he will walk in the cool of the day. Let me read it for you. Genesis 3, 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God. Now, can you imagine this? They heard the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The good part of the day, they, they like, they can hear God walking in the garden. That speaks to God's desire to want to be with his people. But what happened, church? Look at what the verse says. And the man and his wife hid themselves. They have access to God. God wants to dwell with them, but they hide from God. And y'all know why they hear from God, right? Because of sin. Because sin always separates us from God. Sin always interrupts our relationship with God. Prior to them sinning, 
I would imagine when they heard the Lord walking through the garden, they probably ran to embrace him, to be with him. But as soon as sin enters the picture, now they're hiding from the presence of the Lord. Sin always interrupts our relationship with God. That's the reason why when you study the Old Testament very carefully, you realize that God had a symbol of his presence. It was the tabernacle, which eventually evolved into the temple. The tabernacle is where God's name dwelled. It's where God's presence was. But in order for you to go into the tabernacle and commune with God, you had to go through all kind of ceremonial process in order to connect with God. The reason why is because you got to deal with your sin. You just can't step into the presence of God all full of sin. You had to be clean. It was like me when I came home after playing football, trying to come into my mama's house. Mama said, take them shoes off your feet, boy. Come into my house like that. Amen, mama. Y'all know she like cream stuff. Everything in the house, cream. I couldn't, I couldn't even go outside. If I went outside just to get a, fresh, a breath of fresh air and came back in, she's like, take off your shoes. Because we had to keep the house clean. That's how God is. Can't just step into his presence. There was all kind of ceremonial uh, process and systems in place so that people can commune with God. Because that was the only way you can connect with God. It's for your sin to be dealt with. But Jesus came, Emmanuel, and he died for our sins. He dealt with that sin issue so that now we can have regular fellowship, communion, and a relationship with Jesus, with God, through him. He patched up that relationship through his death and resurrection. Now every believer not only has access to the presence of God, but every believer has the presence of God with them because of Jesus. Every believer now, imagine in the Old Testament, you have to go through all this, the ceremonial practices and bring all kind of turtle doves and, and all kind of animals to be sacrificed just so you can get into God's presence. I had to go through all of that. I had to go through all kind of baths. I had to work through a priest. It was a whole process just to connect with God. But in the New Covenant, we now have regular access to God, and we have the very presence of God with us. That's what the Bible teaches. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13, In him, talking about Christ, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed, watch this, with the promised Holy Spirit. The very holy presence, Holy Spirit of God, you're sealed with at the moment of salvation. The Bible goes on to say in verse 14, who was the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire it, acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. We have the very presence of God with us. You know, I, you know sometimes we've got to be careful with our language. I understand what we mean when we say this. I understand what we mean when we say we're going to church and we're going to worship God. We're going to be in God's presence. I know what we mean when we say that. What we mean is that we're going to a gathering of other believers to be able to celebrate and worship our God. But the fact of the matter is, you don't come to meet and commune with God. You already have God with you when you're in route here, if you're a believer, because his holy presence is with you. I mean, that should change some of our perspective about how we come to church, because y'all know how we be. We be holy in church, but on the way to church, we be unholy. Cussing people out. Kids be talking back to their parents. Parents talking to their kids sideways. And then as soon as we come into the church, it's like, oh, you know. And then we leave church and we back at it again. No, you, God's presence is with you in route, in service, and on the way back home if you believe in him. It's interesting because right now we have the presence of God with us, but the fact of the matter is, it is a struggle. We have God's presence, but we live in a world stained by sin. We live in a world corrupted by sin. We still struggle with sin. But I'm so thankful that one day we will be able to experience God's presence without distraction. I look forward to the day that we can experience the presence of God without the struggle of sin. This is the hope that the Bible offers every believer that placed their faith in Christ, that one day we will be able to dwell with God. God will realize God's true intentions of bringing salvation in our lives, and that is to dwell with us in a perfect state. 
That is God's desire. Not just to give you a free ticket from eternity apart from him, but so that you can enjoy him and experience his presence in glory. The Bible says in Revelation 21, beautiful portion of scripture that talks about this hope that we have, that one day we're going to be able to dwell with God without distraction. Revelation 21, and verse 3, the Bible says, And I heard a voice, a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself, now notice the emphasis here. God himself, y'all see that? God, there's, there's an emphasis here. God, who, who are you talking about? God himself, I'm talking about God. The one that's enthroned in heaven, God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death should be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. The fact that Jesus is Emmanuel speaks to God's heart to want to dwell with his people. God has always had a desire to be God with us, to be in our midst. And Jesus is the epitome of that. Because Jesus is Emmanuel, we now have access to the very presence of God. And we can commune with this God. But there's another truth connected to Emmanuel. And I am moving to an end here. But I, I would be remiss if I don't bring out and highlight this other truth. Because it's such a beautiful truth. Not only do we now have access to God because of Emmanuel and access to his presence, which is a beautiful truth. But another dynamic related to Emmanuel is that now God in Christ understands his people. It's a beautiful truth that because we have, because of Emmanuel, we now have access to God. But because God came from heaven to earth in the person of Christ and experienced life, and experience the woes of this world. There is an understanding and a sympathy that God has for his people because he understands. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17, therefore he had to be made like his brothers, that's us, that's believers, in every respect, so that he might become, watch this, a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Why? Verse 18. For because he himself, notice the emphasis. Who are you talking about? Jesus. He himself has suffered when tempted. He is able to help those who are also being tempted. In other words, because Jesus is Emmanuel, and he came up into our space. He understands what we go through. That we serve a Savior that knows what it's like to be abandoned. He knows what it's like to go through suffering. He knows what it's like to go through the mundane of life. Get up, go to work, go back to sleep, get up, go to work, and do it again. He knows what it's like to go through those things. He can sympathize with us. That's the reason why when you're going through a struggle and if you're dealing with a struggle, especially with sin, as a believer, you don't run from God. As a believer, we can run to God because we have somebody with God that understands what we're going through. That's why the Bible says in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, the Bible says, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. For sure, I'm not trying to encourage sin by any means. But, praise God for the buts in the Bible. But if anyone does sin, I'm not telling you to sin. I don't want to encourage sin. Sin always brings consequences. Don't go down that path. Don't touch the stove. It will burn your hand. But if you do sin, praise God, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. When we struggle with sin, oftentimes we want to run from God. But that's an opportunity for us to go to God. And when we go to God, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father saying, I understand what they're going through, Lord. I understand what they're going through, Father. I got them. I get what they're going through. He's advocating for us. 
Matter of fact, the Bible says he ever lives to intercede on our behalf. As a matter of fact, I love this. The Bible says not only should you come to God with your struggles, the Bible says you should come to God cocky in your struggles. Let me read this for you. The Bible says, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, the Bible says, For we do not have a high priest who was unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Jesus is Emmanuel. He experienced what we experience. He's able to sympathize with our weaknesses. But one who, would, who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Such a powerful verse. This verse says that Jesus experienced the struggles we experience, but he didn't let those experiences take him to sin. If there's somebody to help you out, you want somebody that can identify what you're going through, but didn't fall to what you failed to. Amen? I mean, if, if you're struggling with alcohol, for example, probably the best person, one of the best people to help you out, is also somebody else to struggle with alcohol, but they got to have some level of victory before they can help you out. We don't need both of y'all at the bar. You want somebody that I can identify with you, but has experienced some victory in that area. If you need help with math, come holler at me. Y'all know math my subject. But if you say, I don't want Pastor LaVert to help me out because he's going to push me too strong. And that's what my kids say. Push me too hard. Well, my recommendation for you is this. If you want somebody to help you out with math, don't go to a, another student that got an F in math like you. They know the experience, but they don't know the victory. Both of y'all get an F. And then I ought to help both of y'all out. We don't have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. You would think that the next verse would say, so then we should crawl to the presence of God. We should be broken as we go to the presence of God. And certainly there is a sense in which we feel like that. When you wrestle with your sin, like, I don't feel worthy to even come into your presence. There's a sense in which you're like, I don't even want to look up to heaven. Like, there's a sense in which I don't even want to be close to you, God. And you would think that that would be the sentiment in this passage. You struggling with sin, then you better be happy God will let you into his presence. That is very true. But that's not what the verse says. Verse 16 says, let us then. You see that word then? Then is there a lot of what he just said. Because we have a high priest who can sympathize with us. Because we have a high priest that can understand us. The Bible says, let us then with confidence. Some translations try to bring out the force of this Greek word. And so some translations say with boldness. Can I say with cockiness? Not in your own ability. I'm not talking about with arrogance. But with a great expectation that my sin is not going to disqualify me from my God. That I don't have to be scared of my God because of my sin. That I don't have to be afraid of my God because of my mistake. That God is not going to throw me away, away because I did something bad. That I don't have to come in with my head held low, but I can come in with my head up high. I can come up with confidence because I got a high priest that understand what I'm going through. Jesus is next to the Father like, let me tell you, Father, I've been through what he's been through. I know what it's like to go through that temptation. Father, I felt that. I felt that. I felt what that person, I felt what that sister's going through. I felt what she's struggling with. I felt that, Father. Let him on in. Let him on in. And look at what the text says. Such a beautiful text. It says, let us then with confidence draw near. Now, I love this. Oh, my goodness. We got to wrap up here. Oh, my goodness. We got to go. But it says, we got to draw, we draw near to the, the throne of grace. It's a fountain of grace. You know what flows from the throne of God? Of all the things that can flow from the throne of God, his glory, his majesty, his power, his awesomeness, all those things can flow from the throne of God. But in this text, it highlights that of all the things that flow from his throne, one of those streams is grace. There's an unending flow of grace from his throne. 
And you know what you need when you're dealing with sin and dealing with struggles? You don't need judgment. You don't need condemnation. You don't need nobody talking about you, gossiping about you. You don't need fear. You know what you need? You need grace. And the Bible says that you can approach his throne with confidence and receive that grace. Can experience that grace. But not only grace, oh, I've got to wrap this up. But not only do we get grace, but it also says we receive mercy. Oh, my, this is such a beautiful scripture. I mean, come on, God, grace, that's all, all I really need is grace. But he said you can also get mercy. You know what mercy is? Mercy is God withholding the wrath that you deserve. Mercy is God saying, look, I should knock you out. But I'm not going to give you that. I'm going to give you mercy. I'm going to give you mercy. And find grace to help in time of need. Because of Emmanuel. Because we have God with us as our Savior. We serve a God that understands our struggles, our frustrations, our hiccups, our setbacks. He understands it. And we can come to him boldly. Man, I don't even want to say this next part because I it, it might be just too much for me. But let me just say it and then I'm going to slide on out of here. Not only do we have that, not only do we have that, but because we have the very presence of God dwelling with us, man, we're all the way covered. Jesus got us when we struggle. But did you know the Holy Spirit got us as well? I mean, oh my goodness, we got help at the throne room. But we got help on the field, too. The Holy Spirit got us. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 26, I, I, I just got to read this. It says, likewise, the Spirit helps us win, y'all, in our weaknesses. Now, y'all see, see the plural? It's in our weakness, right? In our weakness. It says, for we do not know what to pray as we ought. You ever been there? I don't know what to pray. I'm prayed out. I done prayed about this thing over and over and over again. I don't even know what to say no more. I'm fine. I sound like a broken record. God, I keep saying the same thing. But praise God for the Spirit. Notice the emphasis here. Y'all got to appreciate when the Bible gives us emphasis. Every word of the Bible is important. But the Spirit, what Spirit? Who? Well, who, who are you talking about? The Holy Spirit. The Spirit himself. The Spirit begins to flex in our life. And he intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. You will never know what the Holy Spirit is interceding for you. You will never know when he's interceding for you. You will never know what he's saying on your behalf. You will never know the times that you're praying and you don't know what to say and the Holy Spirit like, I got you. With groans too deep for words. The Bible says in verse 27, and he who searches hearts Talking about God. That verse 27 is a very interesting verse. We won't have time to unpack it, but let me just read it. He who searches hearts, and he here is God. God searches the hearts. But what does he know? He knows the mind of the spirit. You know what this verse is saying? God knows your heart, but God is listening to the spirit. You, you know, we got to be careful. God knows my heart. You better be thankful that God listened to the spirit because when God knows your heart, he knows how wicked your heart is. Don't put yourself up too high on a pedestal. We think my heart is right. Your heart ain't right. That's why you're in the predicament you're in right now, right? He who searches the hearts knows the mind of the spirit. Why is God like, I ain't even listening to you. I'm going to listen to the spirit. Why is God saying, I ain't even listening to you. I'm listening to the Holy Spirit in you. Why is God doing that? The text says, because the spirit always intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. You know what the Holy Spirit does? What the Holy Spirit does is this. Holy Spirit, you're coming to God with something. You're struggling with something. And the Holy Spirit like, man, that's whack. Father, this is what they're really trying to say. Let me adjust. Let me edit what they're saying. Take that out. Cross that out. That ain't even spelled right. No, no, no. This is what they're really trying to say. And the Holy Spirit intercedes for us according to the will of God. Here's the blessing that we have this season. Because of Emmanuel, God with us, we have God with us. The blessing of this Christmas season is because of Emmanuel, God with us. We have God with us. The blessing of this Christmas season 
It's that we don't serve a God that's way out there, way out yonder. We ain't got to go up to yonder. We have a God that's close by. We serve a God that has his very presence in us. A God that's ready to receive us. And it's all because of Emmanuel. I appreciate you guys' uh, patience and uh, appreciate you guys persevering with us this morning. But we're about to wrap up our service. But if it's okay with you guys, we want to wrap up our service the right way. We want to wrap up our service just celebrating Emmanuel and celebrating Jesus. And I'm going to ask for the worship team if they could come up one more time and make their way up. And we're just going to stand together. We're going to stand and celebrate, and then we're going to leave. And you, go and you can go and, and um, enjoy your Christmas holiday. But in light of all that we have in Jesus, is it okay for us just to do one song? To just celebrate Emmanuel. Are you guys okay with that? Is he not worthy of that? There's one song. Now, mind you, we started late too. So let me give myself a little credit. We started late too. But we just want to celebrate Emmanuel and celebrate the fact that we've got a God that loves us, that's near to us, that desires us. Isn't it, doesn't it feel good to be desired? God desires you. He does. And we just want to celebrate that. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus, and we thank you for Emmanuel. We thank you for all that he is to us. We thank you for the salvation that we have in him. We appreciate Emmanuel. We are like those wise men that when we step into the house, we give props to Joseph. We give recognition to Mary, but we bow down to the child. And on today, dear God, we want to do just that. We want to celebrate with each other and acknowledge each other and show love to one another. But we got to celebrate Emmanuel because we have so much in our Savior and we just appreciate him. God, we love you. We thank you. We appreciate you. We bless you. Thank you, Emmanuel. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask for us to stand up, please. You've been sitting for a while. Thank you so much. And the praise team is going to lead us in the song, Emmanuel, and we're just going to celebrate him. I'm going to ask for uh, Tim, if you wouldn't mind, help me to move this podium. And um, they're just going to sing another song. You guys okay with that? Are, are you? Y'all don't sound like you're okay with that. All right, well, we're going to do it anyway. And so uh, but we're just going to worship him and um, celebrate Emmanuel. So, Brother Tim, if you wouldn't mind helping me to move this. And, um, and then praise team is going to sing. And then after that, you guys are free to leave. Thank you so much for being with us on this particular Sunday. Amen. Well, the pastor preached about Emmanuel. And because he's with us, because we're here today on this Christmas morning, we need to all join together and worship him. This is a very simple song, but it says it all. Come. Come. Let us. Come, let us. Worship and adore Him. Come, come, let us come, let us adore Him. We worship you. I 
I think you know it now. We're just gonna say, come. Come, let us. Come, let us adore him. Worship and adore Him. Oh, come. come, let us. Come, come let us adore Him. Just worship him. Emmanuel. Oh, he'll see you through no matter what. Just worship him. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Oh, sing, church. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Aren't you glad he's with us this morning? Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Oh, I love to sing your praise. Emmanuel. Oh, Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Salvation, Emmanuel. Emmanuel. You came to deliver us from sin, Emmanuel. Emmanuel. There's no one like you, Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Oh, thank you, Lord, Emmanuel. Emmanuel. I'm thankful that he's with me today, Emmanuel. Emmanuel. No matter the trials that come my way, I sing, Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Oh, just give him all the praise, Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Oh, praise him, church. Praise him. Emmanuel. No matter, no matter, no matter what you're going through, sing his praise. Emmanuel. Oh, give God the glory. Emmanuel. Oh, Lord, we worship you, Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Oh, Emmanuel. Amen. 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 Father, we thank you again on this Sunday. We worship you. We thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the gift of salvation. Thank you that you so love the world that you gave, your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We appreciate it and we thank you so much. We bless you, God. We honor you. Now to the King eternal immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory, both now and forevermore. And all together, God's people said amen. 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 God bless you guys. Thank you so much. Merry Christmas. Enjoy your day. All right? Amen. amen.